And then the Bible goes on to say in Psalm 107 from verse 8, all that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Praise God for his goodness and the wonderful things he does. The Bible says in verse 9, for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. And he says, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. In verse 13, he says, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and out of the shadow of death and broke their bands as Asunder. In other words, our God is a God of deliverance. It doesn't matter what you've done to get yourself into trouble. When you cry unto the Lord, the Bible says he brings you out of the darkness and he brings you out of the shadow of death. He breaks all the chains and he breaks everything that the enemy was using to afflict his children. I want us to thank him this morning. Let's thank him. Let's give him glory that, oh God, I thank you this morning because whenever I cry to you in trouble, you hear me. Whenever I cry to you, oh God, it doesn't matter the second circumstances or the situations of my life this morning as long as I call the name of the great God I call the name of almighty God my God is ready to answer this morning he is ready to show us his mercy we thank him for this in the name of Jesus thank you father in Jesus name amen and then he says in that same Psalm 107, in verse 20, he said, he sent forth his word. He sent forth his word and he healed them. He healed their diseases and he delivered them from destruction. God this morning is going to be sending forth his word. As the Bible study teachers will be teaching us the word, as the ministers of the word will be ministering in word, as the, the, the praise and worship leaders will be ministering in song, God will be sending his word. And that word that God is sending out, I want you to make up your mind that that word is not going to be in vain. The Bible says he sent forth his word and he healed them of their diseases and delivered them from destructions. So this this morning, as God will be sending his word, I want you to receive the word and say, this morning, I receive the word of God that is able to heal me. I receive the word of God that is able to deliver me. The word of God that is able to remove distraction from my life. The word of God that is able to change me. The word of God that is able to make me look more and more like Jesus. Let's thank God this morning and let's be expectant that as the word of God is going to be coming this morning, there is going to be a tangible manifestation of the word of God. God in your life. The Bible says in Isaiah 55 from verse 10, it says that the word of God, so shall my word be, which goes forth out of my mouth. The Bible says that word will prosper. Where to the thing that God sent it. It says that word will not return to God void. It will not go back to God without changing your life. It will not go back to God without doing a new thing. It will not go back to God and leave you the same. It says that word, so shall my word be, which goes forth out of my mouth. It shall prosper. Where to the thing that I sent it. My word will prosper this morning. That's what God's word says to us. That as the word will be taught, as the Bible study will be going on, as the preachers will be preaching to us, the word of God will make a mark in your life. It will transform you. It will change you. If you are sick, you are going to be healed. If you are in pain, you're going to be delivered. Whatever your situation and circumstance, as the word of God will be coming this morning, there is going to be a turnaround in your life. You are not going to remain the same but you're going to be transformed and you're going to look more and more like God this morning. You're going to be transformed by the word. There's going to be miracles. There's going to be signs and there's going to be wonders for our God is more than able. He is almighty, all powerful. There is nothing that he cannot do. He is faithful. He has brought you this far. The Bible says he who began a good work in you, he is faithful to complete it. He's not going to leave it halfway. What God has started to do in your life, he's going to see it through. It's going to come Come to a good end in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, O oh God. We worship you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. I want us this morning to come under the covering of the sacrifice of Jesus. You know, the Bible says all our own righteousness 
is like filthy rags before God. Even if you think you're perfect, actually the standard is higher than your perfection. What you think is perfection is actually filthy rags in the sight of God. The only way that we can be perfected and we can be acceptable in the presence of God is through the blood of Jesus, through the sacrifice of the eternal covenant. So this morning, let's come by the blood of Jesus. Let's begin to plead that blood upon our lives this morning and pray that Father God, is there any sin that I've sinned against you? Is there anything I've done, oh God, that is outside your covenant and is outside your will? I come by the blood of Jesus this morning. In 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whatever is the sin, God this morning is calling you and saying, come, you are welcome through the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is able to transform your life. The blood of Jesus is able to pay the price for whatever it is that you think you've done. Let's receive the mercy of God this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And then the Bible goes on to say in Colossians 1 verses 12 and 13, it says, giving thanks unto Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We give thanks to our Father who has qualified us to be heirs of the kingdom of light. We give thanks to him. It says in verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. So this morning, if you're a child of God, you are not under the power of darkness. You are not under the kingdom of darkness. The Bible is saying God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his dear um, love, the son of his love, Jesus. He has translated us into the kingdom of his son. We stand this morning as children of the most high God. I want you to thank him this morning and say, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you've made me a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. I thank you that you have made me a partaker of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of light. And I thank you this morning that I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. I thank you this morning that I have forgiveness of sins. I have redemption through the blood of Jesus. I am regarded as a saint this morning by reason of the blood of Jesus. Father God, we thank you once again. Thank you for our salvation. Oh God, we are we are worshiping you this morning for everything you have done for us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Now, let's pray and commit the rest of the service into the hands of God. Let's pray for the ministers that God would use them mightily in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for this service. We worship you because you are faithful. We thank you because you are reliable. You are consistent. You are a good God. You are a kind God. We honor you this morning. We commit this service into your hands. We commit all the servants that you will use this morning into your hands. Let there be fresh anointing, fresh grace released upon them as we go through bible study anoint the teacher as we go to the praise and worship anoint the choir as we go to the ministration of the word anoint the ministers of the word and let your name alone be praised this morning in jesus mighty name we pray amen and amen good morning once again everyone and welcome i hand us over now to our bible study teacher god bless us praise the lord um, thank you, everyone. I hope you've had a, a good week um, in this midst of uh, the pandemic. Uh, the Almighty God will continue to strengthen all of us, you know, guide us, protect us. He's been doing so far wonderfully. We pray that God will continue to see us through. I uh, welcome all of you to this uh, Sunday school session. Um, so let us see you know, what we have for today. Uh, Father Lord, we thank you once again for the opportunity to serve you, for the opportunity to come together, for the enemy has not managed to take that away from us and will never be able to take that away from us. We well, thank you this morning as we uh, deal with the issue of uh, spiritual maturity. Uh, Lord, this is very important for us as Christians. This is an area we need to really make sure that we're dealing with. And I pray this morning that you will help us, the Holy Spirit will help us in this area to grow and to continue to grow so that we can also 
be teachers and role models for the society at large. So in that way, it makes the, the, the gospel message easier so that more people will give their life to Christ. Uh, that is the ultimate command you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, next slide, please. Again, as I said, it's on spiritual maturity today. So it's in the 21st century. So we're talking about the century we are in now. And uh, as I said, it's a time for self-evaluation. After this um, session today, I think what we need to do individually is to reassess our stance uh, when it comes to you know, our work with God. We need to reassess where we are. And that has to be an honest assessment individually. It's not critical. Go and reassess. After listening to this message today, go and reassess yourself and see what you want to do about, about your life. Uh, I don't think anybody has arrived. So if anybody goes home and says, look, I don't have anything to do, then I'll be even more doubtful about their own salvation. So I think all of us will have a message to take away today in Jesus' name. Okay, next slide, please. So our memory verse today um, is taken from uh, the book of Hebrews. We've already done Hebrews 6. So this will be like um, a sort of uh, a remember, sort of for us, just to go back and see what we studied. Yeah, can you can you make the slide a bit smaller so that it, it, it does overlap to the left, to the right side? so that people will see the, the screen. Um, probably it's me who is not seeing it well. Okay, so uh, Hebrews 6, 1. So it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go you know, on to perfection. That perfection, there are some uh, um, uh, translation we said, on, go on to maturity. So that perfection can also be translated to maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, okay? So really, uh, and the New Living Translation also puts it, say, let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. So let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the foundational importance of repenting from evil deeds. So, the book, the, the right, the author of Hebrews here is talking to Jews who, by virtue of where they are and by virtue of the persecution they have been through, most of them are still looking forward to going back to legalism and not moving forward. You know, so this is what the writer is telling them. Okay, now that the place it says it says leaving the principle of the doctrine. Now, as Christians, there are you know things that we need to really things that are the ABC of uh, Christian living. So those sort of things we should know them. We should know them. But in essence, what is happening here is instead of people building on that foundation and moving forward. They are staying there all the time. They're sort of being described as what we would say they are in spiritual kindergarten. They're in the primary school, never going to secondary school or university to qualify. Okay? I will come back to that later on. Let us move on. I'll come back to that later on to explain it much deeper. Introduction. So after salvation, every believer is expected to begin you know, the process of spiritual growth. That is true. That's, that's what all of us are aiming for. Just like a baby goes through regular nourishment, moving from an ordinary milk to some light, you know, sort of solid meal, and eventually to all manner and types of food, uh, inclusive of uh, bones rich in nutritious marrow at adulthood. Okay, so. So all these things are normal processes of growing. And, uh, you know, we are told that we shouldn't just be like stagnant, you know, where we are. We need to continue to move on, to grow, 
to be able to chew, you know, the bones as they describe it there. So um, he continues to say that God, uh, the, you know, the, to claim the spirit of God lives in you without his presence and you are affecting your life choices. Spiritual maturity is achieved through becoming a more, more like Jesus day by day. That's, that's what we need to show the world, that we are more like Jesus as he focuses on living in his footsteps. Now, what I will tell you here before we move on is that um, with this introduction, I want you to have a picture, have a picture of you know, those of you who have children, like me, I have had this thought. When you have a child, you want your child to grow. You know, in fact, you go for what we call a baby check, usually at eight weeks, yeah? When you go, the doctor gives you the, the and the nurse, they give you what we call the red book. So that red book is a chart of the baby's growth. So anytime you come to check the baby, they will measure the weight and the height and they will chart it and they will follow the progress of the baby's growth. So this is what we do in the clinic. And every time you come, the nurse measures it, the doctor tells you, oh, this your baby is growing. You are happy. You are happy. Of course, you want your baby to grow. But just imagine what happens if all of a sudden you come for that check and the doctor tells you this child is not growing anymore it will arouse a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry. And immediately the doctor wants to investigate why this baby is not growing. So also the issue with spiritual maturity. Although we don't have a, a place where we go to assess us or to chat us who is who, it's difficult to measure spiritual maturity because some people by virtue of what they say and by virtue of the way they carry themselves, doesn't actually portray how mature they are. But the, what I'm telling this morning is that God sees how mature you are. And you don't need to have a stunted growth when it comes to spirit, spiritual things. We need to grow. And by the end of today, you will understand more about what you need to possess, how you need to carry yourself so that people know that you are growing. That's the sense of today's study. You see, because although we look at it, we don't, I always like practical examples. Just imagine how odd also it will look like um, one of our teenagers coming to, like Danny, my son, for example, or Leo. We we'll see him in, a, in church carrying a bottle like Oma, Oma and the, and the sister, uh -uh, drinking milk. And he said, oh, I want to drink only milk now. That is going to arouse a lot of concern. But that is actually what is happening in, 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 with this Hebrew, with, with this Hebrew, what the, the Hebrew author is actually saying here about the Jews. They've all of a sudden gone back to become babies. And these are full adults. Yeah? So please, can you put it into perspective here? Yes, that's what we're talking about. When you are not growing in the eye of God, God is seeing you that you are carrying a bottle of milk instead of eating proper food. And that is not normal. The author of Hebrews said today, grow up. So we need to grow up from that. In essence, what we are trying to do today, we are trying to make sure that as Christians, believers must move beyond the basics of Christian faith and grow up in Christ. Yes. Those basics, we need to move on from that the spiritual kindergarten. We need to move on to qualify, to have degrees. Okay, so next, next slide, please. So our lesson text today um, is taken from Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Um, and uh, again, this, the way it's projecting here is not coming out properly, but... Uh, let me see. Can read it from. Yeah, do you want to make it a bit smaller with the projection? So I think it's all right for us who are watching on Zoom. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. I will. Uh, yeah. I will read it from my own Bible. This side. Um, okay. 
So this, as I said before, we've done we've done Hebrews. Uh, so this one is just going to be a refreshment, a refreshment for us. So, so, so this this Hebrew says, you say, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you needed you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So that is what we're going to look at today. But having said so, you know, we are going to look at it. It's a very short this thing, but it's, there's a lot, a lot of things for us to learn from this, from what we have just read. And looking at it, what I've done is I've just summarized it in a way of, of what you needed to take away today, uh, the truths about the spiritual maturity that we're, we're dealing with today. So, so the, the first point I want you to consider is that you can actually, um, um, it is possible to be a Christian, but to grow slowly. That's number one. It is possible. Yeah. All of us are not growing the same. Some people, when they give their life to Christ, you know, they were riddled by some form of sin. Uh, they give it up, they fly, they never look back. But other people, they also do the same thing, give their life to Christ, but somehow they, 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 they keep going back to that sin which they, 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 they were living with before, and they keep struggling, sort of going through phases of uh, relapses. They relapse into it, they come ready, they realize they need to be following God, they go back again, until eventually, you know, they, they, they give everything up. So what are we trying to say? We are trying to say that uh, if there is spiritual life, there will also be spiritual growth of some sort. But all of us are not going to grow exactly. The growth will vary. But what is important is that we are seen to be making some growth. That's what is important. Now, if we... This is what we read. If we just actually go back to uh, Hebrews 5.11, we will see there that the, that the Bible was talking about, uh, the, 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 those, the, the author of Hebrews was talking about uh, them having become dull to hearing, dull to hearing, okay? So, so this dull to hearing is, is very, very important that we don't become dull to hearing because it's one of the things that hinders our growth. Okay, and what do you, when are you dull? You are dull when you are uh, spiritually lazy, now lethargic, you don't want to do things. They say there is a Bible study this evening. You say, oh, I have to, I, I'm feeling tired, I cannot join. They say there is a prayer session. You say, oh, I have a meeting. Yeah, you keep dodging the things of God for no reason. That is, you have become dull of hearing, you don't want to hear. Right, now the other thing I want to tell you about this issue is that in order for us to grow, we have to be motivated. Motivation is a key to learning. Yeah, as the Bible says in uh, Matthew, if you have your Bible, you can do that or you can jot it down, Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger for tests for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst, they are strong motivators. Just imagine if you are hungry or if you are thirsty. The only thing is, that is in your mind is to find food or water. To find food or water. You are just like a crazy man. If you, you haven't found that, your mind is not at ease. So if you are driven then by hunger or thirst for righteousness, the Bible is telling us there that you will be satisfied. Yes. That is the, one, the, the satisfaction we need, not of, of earthly things, but of righteousness. We have to hunger for righteousness. We have to test for righteousness. And let me give you a warning. There is nothing like a neutral Christian. You see that you are growing or you are shrinking. 
Don't say that you remain in a state of auto autopilot in your spiritual life. Every year you are in, you are floating in one in the same level. There's nothing like that. It's either you are growing or you are shrinking. So you just have to make up your mind where you want to be, whether you want to grow or whether you want to shrink. Now, the second point I want to talk to you about is that the Christian growth means moving on to deeper level of understanding. It's, it's, it's no good. It's good learning the basics, but it's also you need to move on. You cannot hold on to the basics, the ABCs. You cannot remain forever in spiritual kindergarten. You have to move on to higher levels. You have to move on to deeper grounds. As I said, you know, beyond the basics, once you dig deeper, it's actually the deeper and nourishing truth that we need to learn. And we need those ones as well. Somebody once said that Bible is like an ocean. It's deep enough to drown an elephant, but shallow enough at the shore for a toddler to play. So what if you read too much, if you read meaning into that sentence, you will see that everybody is at a different level. When you are a babe, you are in the shore. You are just tapping the water at the shore. But once you are stronger, you can swim, you go deeper and dig up, you know, the truth and the deeper things about God. And the other thing I want to let us know as well is that we do recognize that everybody doesn't have to be a teacher. You know, some people are gifted to teach. Uh, but there is a sense to say that once you've been in the church for a few years, that you should actually have some knowledge, you be knowledgeable enough in, in, in the scripture to teach the younger believers. And I, I don't think that is something you need to really go to theology school for. But I think it is something that we acquire, we should acquire automatically as Christians and as maturing Christians. So we should be able to teach the younger believers at least the basics of the, the principles of or the, or the oracles of God. So we should take that responsibility and make sure we execute it. And while we are still talking about going deeper in scripture, I, I have to tell you that every Christian, although we seem to say, ah, people go to theology school to qualify, we say, ah, well, I cannot compete with them. They've been to theology school. How long does theology school last? Highest, they study for four or five years. But you've been a Christian for 10 years, some people 15, 20. Is it not more than the, 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 the number of years they went to study? So as a Christian, you should see yourself as a theologian. You should be able to study the Bible, digest it, dig deeper into it, harmonize, synthesize. Yeah, don't think that it's meant for some people with some, some sort of brain. All of us are gifted. The Bible is there for us. We can read it and become theologians ourselves. The problem is not about being becoming a theologian. The problem, the question is that, are you growing to be sound in your theology or are you shallow, mixed up and assuming on biblical things in your theology. So the next point we need to discuss about is that Christian growth is directly related to obedience to the truth that you have already learned. Truth. Truth. So, truth. So again, where the 513, where the Bible was saying for every everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He describes the spiritually matured as those who eat solid food, yeah? Who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil, okay? So here, when we look at it again, um, you may think that righteousness and good and evil are obvious, 
but they are actually not obvious in certain circumstances. Some things still need to be discerned. Yes, some things need to be discerned. That place uses the word accustomed. Mean accustomed meaning means lacking experience. Okay, so it is used also in uh, numbers, numbers fourteen twenty three, to refer to some inexperienced youth who have not yet learned good and evil. Um, so good and evil refers not only to our ethical conduct, but also true and false doctrine. True and false doctrine. Now, both our ethical conduct and good and uh, false doctrine, they require discernment. Although people tend to discern much easier about our conducts than actually sound and false doctrine, because that's why we have a lot of uh, false teachers today, because they managed to twist the, the, strict, the, the scripture in a way to confuse people who are not learned enough or who are not deep enough. And so they thrive with their false doctrine. So but be careful. A, a very good example here is the issue of uh, homosexual men, for example. OK, so the society we live in now seems to think it's normal. They, you know, they say, ah, well, once they say they love themselves, what is wrong with that? And they bring love, Christian love into it. And they can twist that love in such a way that yourself, you become confused if you don't know what the Bible says. Okay? So, so, so what are statistics in America that's found that 55% uh, uh, of our evangelical protest protestants said they have strong views against homosexual men? But more interesting is what happened to the 45% who didn't think it, it was something, there was something wrong with them. So this, this is a society we live in. This is a society we live in. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful. So when we study the Bible or theology, whichever we want to call it, always study with the aim to obedience and godly living. That's what you want to get out. There's no point of reading the Bible if, not, if you're not going to obey what the Bible is saying. And there's no point of also doing that if you're not going to, if it's, if it's not going to lead you to holy living. So those two are always together. Now, the next point about maturity today is that Christian growth requires laying the foundation of doctrine and then building on it. So this is good. We, just, we go back to the, our memory verse, OK? So that was what our memory verse was talking about. Um, so, so, so what he's talking there is that, that we need to, the, the author of Hebrews is exhorting his readers that the elementary teaching about Christ is, is telling them to move on. He's not telling them to leave it because it's important that you know those elementary teachings, but he's telling them to press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. Yeah. So I will tell you some of this foundation. They are mentioned it from six to chapter six, from verse one to three. Mentions those six foundations. I'll, I'll mention them to you so that you'll be aware of them. Um, so, so, so as I said before, uh, he's not suggesting that they leave these things because they're important. He's rather saying that once you've laid a proper foundation, you don't go back digging on the foundation again. You need to move on. You need to build your. You need to erect your building. Yeah. Have you ever seen somebody who wants to build a house, he laid a foundation, but every time he goes and keep digging up the foundation, the building will not be, be, be finished. So the, these foundations, let me just mention some of them now. The first one he mentioned in that six one is repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Okay, that's the, that's, those are the two. Repentance from dead work is one and faith towards God is two. So those are two foundations we need that you know when we we've started when we studied um uh, hebrews 9 we saw at hebrew 9 1 that we mentioned about this uh, uh dead works uh to, to say that um uh which talks about the blood of jesus cleansing our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living god we did mention that then we did study it as well so so really what are we saying we are saying that this is important we cannot cannot forget this. This is a very important foundational knowledge. You know, repentance from dead works and faith towards God are at the heart of the gospel. We can't separate one from the other. 
Both of them are equally important. So you cannot trust Christ as your savior without turning from sin. Equally, the person who turns from sin has, has Christ as his only hope. There's no other hope. That's why people turn from sin to, to give their life to Christ. Okay? But again, there, the, the author says the, that you should have faith towards God. He didn't say have faith towards Christ because Christ is the one who leads us to God. Christ, through the mediation of the Son, we turn to the Father. Right. So other uh, foundational um, sort of uh, backgrounds there that was mentioned, as I said, if you read that, if you read further to uh, Hebrews 6, uh, or 2 to 3, you'll find out that the instruction uh, about washings, some verses will say washing, some will say baptism. So instruction about baptism and laying of hands. So those are two, two more instructions. And then the last couple of two will be the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. So these things are foundational. We, 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 we know these things. But the, what, the, what the author is saying here is that don't dwell on these things. We need to dig deeper. We need to dig deeper. Knowing them is not enough. Right. So the last point I want you to learn before we move on is that Christian growth does not happen automatically. Okay. It takes deliberate effort from our side with God's enablement. Yes. We need to put some effort. It's not good enough. We have learned about practice. Practice refers to the habit that is formed by deliberate effort. Whereas we also talk about training. We gave the, the reference to an athletic who wants to train to be a, you know, a, a, a sportsman by career. They train, they give up a lot of things. They give up those things that wear, wears them down. They, 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 they deliberately don't look at distractions. So also shall we, if we want to grow, we have to put a deliberate effort. It's not going to come just like that by us lazying around. But we also need to know that God will have to enable it. Because if we look at um, uh, Hebrews 6, 3, it wrote that uh, we will move on to deeper teaching if God permits. So God has to come with it. Without divine aid, the plan is not possible. God has to support it. So what are we saying? We're saying that why spiritual growth is our responsibility and requires our effort, Beneath the whole process is God's power. I think Apostle Paul finally balances this in Philippians 2, 12 to 13, where he says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That summarizes it. So, before we move on, this is the bulk of today's teaching. This is what I've said today. Is if you take it, you are safe. Let me remind you again. Let me recap. We do realize that spiritual growth is more difficult to measure than your child's physical growth. But you can be sure that you are not growing if your spiritual life is running on an autopilot. You will not be growing. You are also not growing if you are haphazard with Bible study and your prayer life. You are also not good growing if you are not making a deliberate effort to discipline your life for godliness. If you are not growing, you are shrinking, as I said before, there's no neutral ground. The author of Hebrews, where we have just read, is telling you, grow up, me and you, grow up. Let's move on. Yeah, let's go to the lesson outlines now. Yeah, so let's also look at some of the characteristics of a spiritual Christian. Now, you say you're a spiritual Christian. I say I'm a spiritual Christian. Let us look at these characteristics. Do we have them? A spiritual Christian lives as a son, not, not as a slave. Yes, the Bible have reassured us in Romans 8, 14 to 16. He said, for all who are led for all who are uh, led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, 
but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by, who, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, what the Bible is saying there is that once you and me are declared children of God, either by the fact that we have given our life to Christ and by adoption as well, even in the physical realm, people who are adopted, what happens? They leave their fam original family, come to the adopted family, and by law, they should inherit all the inheritance that there is in the new family. And the old family has been forgotten. So that's what the Bible is telling us here. Sin is the one that puts us, enslaves us. We have given that up. Christ has died for us, redeemed us from this sin. Why do you want to go back to live as slave again? You can't. You can't. So, but that is what worries most of us. We don't know who we are. Sometimes we think because of worldly circumstances, we see ourselves as slaves again. The Bible is warning us here that we are sons of God. We've been adopted into the family. We should not live like slaves. Okay, that's number one. Number two, a spiritual Christian is led by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of this flesh. What does it mean by walking by the spirit? You walk by the spirit when the spirit lives in you, when you are open and sensitive to the influences of the Holy Spirit. And when you pattern your life to the influences of the Holy Spirit, then you are walking by the spirit. He bears, a, a spiritual Christian bears the fruit of the spirit. Yes, once you are walking in the spirit, as I said in last week's presentation, once you are walking in the spirit, every day, step, your step by step, you allow the Holy Spirit to take, take it. You soon develop the fruit of the spirit. Because that is the outward manifestation, what people will see about you. And what are those fruits? They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Bible is telling us that against such things there is no law against such things there's no law we move on so a spiritual christian makes spiritual things the priority over natural pursuit oh yes we have to prioritize spiritual things we have to prioritize spiritual things put put in a priority now that roman 8 5 Romans 8, 5, he said, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, set their mind on the things of the spirit. So there is two mindsets here. You say that your mind is set on the flesh or your mind is set on the spirit, spiritual things. Yeah? Now, let me also just give you a little bit of uh, warning here. People can set their mind on the things of the flesh and still be noble people who have good intentions. Do you remember when Christ was about to go to the cross? Peter was trying to tell Christ not to go to the cross. But did you know what Christ answered Peter in Matthew 16, 23? He says, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, here Peter, didn't. it's not that he, he was living in the flesh, but because of the love he has for Christ, he was pleading with him not to go and have this suffering. But Obviously, he wasn't seeing the spiritual things that are at stake there. So he was thinking from the flesh. His mindset was on the sort of what we would describe fleshly. But this is an example of somebody who, although he was thinking in the flesh, but didn't have no harm. He didn't have no harm. He wasn't saying that out of any harm. Now, when you are a spiritual Christian, you are free from the law. Yes. Now. That uh, Romans um, um, 8 2, it says, For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. If you read Romans 8 1, the conclusion is that the, 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 it tells you about you know, the guilt of sin. Now, Romans 8 2. Is mainly talking about the power of sin. All these things will be liberated from by the blood of Jesus. So we should not be going back to them again. 
and that uh, they put to death the deeds of the flesh. Well, Colossians 3, 5 to 9, have mentioned a lot of things there. I'm not going to read them out, but there is one thing I want you to, 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 to take home from there. Uh, the thing is that um, there is the importance in listing and naming this sin as Apostle Paul did there. Yeah? So, because it is far easier to drift into a sin which one does not know by name. And when you know it by name, you say, ah, this is stealing. Ah, am I going to steal? It registers better. So, that's why it's important that it's listed those things there so that you can actually say them by name and make sure you don't have any reason to suggest that you didn't know what you were doing. So uh, the last point there is that they are uh, divinely guided and have spiritual insight. Yes, when you are walking by the spirit, you're a Christian and the spirit is leading you, you will have insight, plenty of insight. Okay, next slide, please. Let us look at now the signs. No, no, there's another, yeah, the, after the characteristics will be the signs of spiritual maturity. Did you get that in the slides? Can I read them out? Okay, so the signs of spiritual maturity, uh, the first one is that they, they, we, we've read it from the, our the text message, uh, an appetite for stronger spiritual meat, which we've been talking about the whole morning uh, in, in, in Hebrews uh, 5, uh, 12 to 14. Okay, so that person will have that appetite. He will not be a baby in Christ. He'll be growing, he'll be mature. Now, the, um, the next thing, a sign that shows that you are a spiritually matured Christian is that they do not yield to personal offenses, yeah? Now, in that Philippians 1, 15 to 18, um, we see that it was Apostle Paul, who, when the Apostle Paul was in prison, yeah? So he was talking about some people who preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. He was also talking about others who preach Christ who proclaim Christ from their own heart, who wasn't doing it out of selfish uh, uh, means. But he, he was saying that either, in either way, he's not bothered in as much as Christ is proclaimed and Christ is preached, okay? He didn't get he was very angry about the people who are teaching about Christ due to selfish ambitions. But, but he, he, he carried on and said he is happy, even if both of them in as much as Christ is preached. So again, one of the qualities we need to have as a signs that we need to be portraying as a spiritually mature Christians is that we don't yield to offenses very quickly. You know, the other brother offended you and you lash out. You know, you don't talk to them for ages. You know, so we should be tolerant in both good and bad circumstances. We should be tolerant. Now, the other quality, the other sign that you are a spiritual Christian is that they have a conscience informed by scripture, not personal or societal opinion, okay? So that in, uh, that, that place that the Bible, uh, Romans uh, uh, 14, one to three, I think is just uh, talking about our, how we exercise our Christian liberties, yeah? It, it's mainly to do with how do we relate to other people that we feel are weaker in their faith than us. Okay, the Bible is telling us that we need to accept them. We don't have to, you know, sort of um, allow spiritual maturity to be a requirement for fellowship. Yeah, we need to find a, a level ground and uh, accept them and show more maturity to them so that, you know, things will, will go on as, as normal. And then there, uh, the, the, there's a sense of humility. Now, the issue of humility, really, we should have. We should have because that is the center. If, if not for anything, the humility is, 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 is the one that we really need to be showing. Because if we don't show that, um, it will come across very bad for our, for our image. And uh, I don't want people to, to, to sort of think and say, oh, I am humble. No, you are not humble. It is somebody around you who will determine how humble you are. Yeah? 
that people can assess how humble you are. Your colleagues, your husband, your wife, those are the people, your children, those are the people who will say whether you are humble or not. Yeah? Yeah. And the fact that you, you, can, you can teach Bible or you know Bible inside out or you are a prayer warrior doesn't make you to be humble. Doesn't make you to be humble at all. Uh, if you are a Christian who always find it difficult to say, I'm sorry, then you are not humble. And if you're a Christian as well, who find it difficult to be found at fault with anything, every time you are right with everything, mm -mm, you might not be humble. Because these are all characteristics of pride. So you need to examine yourself again. That the humble spirit is the spirit that says, I'm sorry, very easily. The humble spirit is the spirit that says, oh, I know too much. I know more than you, but let me just listen to you and not talk over you. And let me also tell you, the best place to assess humility is not when you are talking to your senior. It's when you are dealing with somebody who is below you, who is inferior to you. But that is usually when we exhibit pride. Work on this. Ex examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Make sure you are hum humble. Now, another sign of a spiritual Christian is a tendency to give credit for spiritual growth to God, not to people. Yes. These days, when you watch some women and men of God, they think it's their, by their power. Anything that happens, any miracle is by their power. And then all of a sudden, they realize themselves that they are messing themselves up. Yeah, that I don't know there were, what, how many of you has watched. There was this, uh, uh, the, all the bad things always come from Nigeria first. There, there is this um, uh, witchcraft or uh, occultic man who has asked people to line themselves up in the river and is praying for them and pouring money on them and saying, you will be rich, both men and women, naked. Okay? And then he was saying, oh, give uh, Abara, Abara in Igbo, he's devil. You give to the devil, devil give you. That's what is enchanting people who didn't understand the Igbo. But you were understanding what he was saying. Okay? Now, people are desperate. They think that man is their savior, right? Later on, when they caught him on TV questioning him, when he was speaking, did you know that he didn't mention anything about Abara anymore? He was talking about God. He was mentioning Christ. <laughs> so be careful. Be careful who you get involved with. Be careful what you listen. Be careful who you trust. Anybody who is very quick to say how powerful they are. They are not, they are not from God. They are not a Christian. They are not a spirit, they, 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 they are not showing spiritual maturity. Be careful about them. So let us uh, conclude. Next slide. Yeah, so in summary, really, you know, as Christians, we're expected to uh, be matured and not canal. you know, and the signs of spiritual maturity should be evident in our lives. We should. People should see it. Yeah, as I said before, please don't, don't assess yourself how much a, of a Christian you are. Let the people around you speak. And most of, most of the time, what they are telling you is the truth. Yeah, although people are not the best guide, our Lord Jesus Christ and God upstairs are watching all of us. And even where people get it wrong, God will not get it wrong. So please, let us walk right. So in conclusion, you know, what, are, what are we saying? We are saying that you know, becoming a spiritually uh, mature Christian, we, sh we should really uh, possess that in the church. And as I said before, all of us should have the capacity to teach young Christians so that, you know, they will, so that we can also progress. And as I said before, we need to self-appraise ourselves, see where we are. See how, how, much, how much we are growing. You know, as I said before, you know, we need to grow. We shouldn't allow our spiritual life to be an autopilot. You know, you are not growing when your Bible study life is haphazard and prayer life. You are also not growing when you are not making a deliberate effort to discipline your, you know, your life and godliness in godliness. So if you are not growing, you are shrinking. 
there is no neutral ground. And that is the conclusion. I hope this message has touched you in a way. And I hope that the Almighty God will um, help you as you ponder and as you appraise yourself. Uh, so I will uh, pray now. I'll pray that the Almighty God will help us, will help us in our spiritual lives, will help us in everything we are doing, will help us to correct any mistakes and anywhere that we are not growing. We pray that God will continue to help us spiritually to grow, help us spiritually to attend Bible studies, to study, you know, to, to, to actually pray and study the Bible, because in such a way, you know, we will uh, attend growth. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.